Okay, so let's uh, restart the class. Cool, let's get it on. So, uh, <laughs> Chin, Chan Chin Yong, yes. why do you think that uh, global financial regulation is an important issue? Uh, it turns the uh, cooperation with the company. Mm -hmm. Uh, in operation, in the break, economy, 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 circulation. What would happen if we didn't have any regulation of, of financial industries? And we didn't have any global regulation. What could happen? Chaos. Chaos? So, probably in different classes and from different teachers, you heard a lot of different ideas about the cause of the financial crisis. The US central bank increased the interest rates, the oil price got very high, people were invested, speculating too much in real estate, right? The bankers had a corrupt culture, right? They weren't supervised properly. But the Treasury Secretary of the US blames the UK for the financial crisis. He said the reason is financial deregulation. So we have we we already talked before about the problem we have regulation and we have culture. Because we can't regulate for everything. We can't regulate for everything, so we need to have the right culture. Okay? But we also need to have regulation too. Right? Not just if we just had culture it would be fine. But there's always some bad egg and we need to have some re regulation over this structure. So what happened in uh, 2000, 2001, that time period? The UK introduced deregulation of the financial in industry. Why? According to Timothy Geithner, who was the US Treasury of the Secretary at that time of the crisis, very, probably the person who was most involved in the financial crisis was Timothy Geithner. He wrote a book about that and he also, you can watch interviews with him. You go to YouTube and type in Timothy Geithner, Bloomberg, you can watch an interview of him talking about the financial crisis. He's the person who knows much, most about the financial crisis in the world. Because uh, he was the Minister for Finance of the US at the time. Minister of Finance in the US is called Secretary of the Treasury. Secretary of the Treasury, right? Uh, he's changed now. And he was involved in negotiating with the banks and that kind of thing. So he's, he blamed the UK in a speech. He said that the UK brought in regulation, deregulation in 2000. Why? They want to attract the banks from New York to London. Right? London and New York are the two main financial centres in the world. Okay, they're fighting with each other for business. Does the UK manufacture anything anymore? What does the UK manufacture? Rolls Royce. Not much, right? Just a few things. What does they, do they manufacture in the US? Do they manufacture many things in the US? Uh, no. No, so what's the main business of the US and the UK? Financial industry. Financial services. New York, do you know New Mexico? Yeah. Very poor state in the US near the Mexican border. New York transfers billions of dollars there every year to pay for pensions and health care and so on. Where does New York get the money from? The financial, in taxing the financial industry, right? The same in the UK, you have the city of London and you have the UK. Where are the people in the northern part of the UK with high unemployment? Where do they get their social welfare money from? Financial. financial. Taxes on the financial industry in London, the city of London, right? So the financial industry these days is a very important industry for the US and the UK. So they're fighting over the banks. Come to London, no, come to New York, come to London. So they had a race to the bottom. Do you understand race to the bottom? 
on regulation. Two important things for companies are regulation and tax. Does a company want to go to a country which has more regulation or less regulation? Why? Yes, you can take more risks. Why? You can make more profits if you take more risk, but you have a chance of a bigger chance of a loss. But if you lose, oh well, other people lost their money, I still got my high bonus and CEO salaries, right? Hard luck for them. I'll get a job somewhere else. Okay? You can take a higher risk. What about tax? You want to lower tax, right? So if countries don't cooperate globally, we're going to have a race to the bottom between countries. Do you understand race to the bottom? Race to the top, race to the bottom. Okay, race to the top, we're trying to be the best, right? Race to the bottom, we're trying to get the lowest price, or the lowest regulation, or the lowest tax. Ireland is involved in this race too. Dublin, not that important as London or New York, but Dublin was trying very hard. It was winning the race to the bottom, making even lower regulation than London, and even lower tax than London. Why does Dublin make, need to make even lower tax and regulation than London? If you're going to move your Korean bank to another city, are you going to move it to London or Dublin? London. Why? London is too important. It's an important financial centre. There are a lot of other banks there, right? There are other things that you can get access. So other con Ireland has to make even lower to attract the banks. Do you understand? So can you see the problem? If we have this race to the bottom, what can happen? Countries are not cooperating, they're competing, right? Like before the World War. They're competing with each other, and we can end up with the situation of not the proper regulation for the banks. Okay? We don't have proper regulation for the banks. They take too much risk, they're not supervised, and they can go bankrupt. And the banking industry is special. For another industry, it could go bankrupt, it might be okay. But the banking industry, if it goes bankrupt, it's a really big problem. Businesses can't get loans, people can't get loans, okay? People lose all their savings, or lose a lot of their savings. So, we have to try to regulate the financial industry. On a simple way, do you want to go to a pizza restaurant which is regulated or not regulated? Regulated. What kind of regulation do they have for pizza restaurants? No smoking. No smoking. Anything else? Hygiene. Hygiene, health and safety, fire escapes. So you can go to some country where they don't have much regulation. Let's say, I'm just guessing, I don't know, Vietnam or Cambodia, I've never been there, right? You can go to the pizza restaurant, the hygiene is very bad, they never get any inspection. They have no health and safety. First you eat your pizza, it's really bad, you can get sick, right? They didn't wash their hands or they didn't do any hygiene. Next there's a fire in the restaurant, you can't get out, right? It's made of wood. The restaurant is made of wood, very flammable. There's no fire escape. You're in trouble. Okay? So can you understand the need for regulation? Yes. So in that case, if we have no regulation, then the pizza restaurant can do those kind of unsafe activity. And we can get damaged. The consumer. It's the same for the banks. They can do the unsafe activity and corrupt activity and they can damage the society. So the reason we need global regulation, we don't want countries to compete. So we want the UK and the US to get together and say, let's make the same regulation, high tax and high regulation on banks, okay? So after the crisis, we had the situation where countries got together and said, okay, let's make more regulation. And the US made their own regulations and the UK made their own regulations, the EU. But well, they came to the UK, in Europe, and they said, let's make a new regulation. Every country in Europe agreed, apart from the UK. Do you know the excuse of David Cameron? What did he say? What was his excuse? Not to make a new regulation in the UK. He said, Singapore. Singapore could make very low regulation, and all the banks will go to Singapore. So I think there's no point to make regulation in the UK. Do you agree with David Cameron? 
Do you think that if David Cameron brings in new regulation in the UK, then all the banks will go to Singapore? Because the regulation is low in Singapore, and they're not in the G20 or the EU or the US, so Singapore can just do what they like? Yes. He's right. You think he's right? All the banks will just go to Singapore? Yes. Okay. So we have the example, I don't agree with him because we have the example of Sweden, where Sweden has a very high taxes and regulation on businesses. And before Sweden brought in the taxes, all the businesses told Sweden, we're going to leave. But after they brought in the regulation and taxes, they threatened to leave, but they didn't actually leave. Why? Because the CEO's kids were in school in Sweden. They were in the local school and they didn't want to change their kids. Why? To another school or another country. Their wife didn't want to go to another country. The company already had paid for the land and had a good relationship with the people in Sweden. So I don't agree with David Cameron. I think he's just making an excuse. Why? Right? Uh, the problem is that we talk about global regulation. There are 190, 200 countries in the world. We have to get all of these countries to agree together. It's not easy. We can maybe we, even getting the G20 to agree is not easy. Okay. But then when we go out, you can always get some small country like Singapore or the islands in the Caribbean, like Bermuda, small island, right? They can say, we don't agree. Can anybody force them to join the agreement? Can we say to Singapore, if you don't join this agreement, we are going to attack your country? No, so this is the problem. But there, it's an important issue global regulation, but one country like the UK don't agree in Europe, what happened? All of the other countries went ahead with the regulation apart from the UK. So the UK got some advantage. Okay? And now the UK is talking about leaving the EU in 2017. So again, if the UK leaves the EU, it, it thinks it can get some advantage because it doesn't have to keep the regulations inside the EU. By the way, the UK was also the first country to cause the problem in the 1930s. It was the first country to leave the gold standard at the time and uh, depreciate its currency. All the countries had a fixed exchange rate, but the UK left. And also the UK left the forerunner of the euro, the ESM, because they had high unemployment in England, so they decided to leave. So the UK has a history of not, if it doesn't agree with something, it just tends to go its own way rather than follow the consensus. Okay? Uh, so, they might say that's positive sometimes, as in the Second World War when the Nazis controlled all of Europe, just Britain uh, wouldn't, well, they had the advantage of the sea, the tanks couldn't go across the sea, but they didn't uh, <coughs> negotiate or make any agreement with the, the Nazis. So. Uh, do you understand the answer to this question, why the global financial regulation is important? Why? We want to stop countries from racing to the bottom and we need to have regulation on the financial industry because it's very important. So, the next point is uh, transportation networks. So, there are about 100,000 uh, large ships carrying cargo and passengers all across our planet. And state-owned Chinese companies control one-fifth of the global container fleet. So we can see a lot of Chinese companies shipping. If you looked at the ship, global shipping map, a lot of ships going from ports in Shanghai, Hong Kong, Beijing to the US, right to Europe, to other countries. We also have, uh, if you look at the air maps, you can see all the airlines flying across the, wor the world. It's estimated that the air travel accounts for up to 5% of the greenhouse gas emission, which is quite high relatively. So the world is interconnected well on the transportation. Let's talk about the media. So Thomas Friedman argues that technological connectivity could accomplish nothing of value in the absence of social, political and cultural connections that create real understandings across these boundaries. So, if you, what he's saying here is you just make friends with Facebook with somebody from Russia that you don't know, random. Do you accept random people as friends on Facebook? No. No? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> get, up, get up your friends to make it look like you have more friends. 
Do you send random invites to people? Yes. Yes? Makes it look like you have more friends. <laughs> how do you pick how do you choose the people? Handsome guy. Handsome guys? <laughs> Send some random invites, but you guys said you didn't get any random invites, right? <laughs> okay. So, uh, if we just make some technological connections, but we don't have any social interaction, we don't talk to them, we don't meet them, we don't have any political or cultural connection, we don't try to understand their culture, that kind of thing, then it's useless. Okay, so discuss this question with your partner. How could global media do more to create a greater sense of global community and reduce conflict between different cultures and societies? What culture or society does Korea have conflict with? What, what culture or society do you have conflict with? Water. Hmm? What country does Korea have some conflict with? Uh, Japan. Japan. Japan and? China. And? Korea. And don't forget North Korea. <laughs> so, for example, what country does Denmark have conflict with? Chips. Uh, I think maybe <laughs> Far East. Far Middle Eastern countries. Yeah. There was some cartoon. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us the story? A uh, Danish newspaper made a a uh, cartoon of Mohammed with bomb on his head mm -hmm. and suddenly the other the other day um, the export of dairy products went just to zero it just completely stopped uh, the um, cooperation completely stopped so Denmark wanted to be like funny like for Danish people it's just funny they didn't make any political statement but Muslim countries took this offense and they stopped uh, buying products from Denmark okay so then discuss how can global media create a greater sense of global community and reduce conflict between different cultures and societies. In that case we had an example maybe of global media making conflict. We didn't have global media people would have known about it. Not as many people would have known. Actually, yeah. But I mean, they probably share this on Facebook. In their Research, uh, we can make better reduce the conflict, right? Yes, for companies, right? What about for individuals? Understand each other's differences. Mm. Understand each other's differences. Mm. Anybody else? For individuals 
there is lots of like travel blogs and when people travel to different countries and they write about their experiences and they make lots of pictures and it actually shows that this culture is maybe different and we expect it. Okay. So you can put your write about your travel experiences on a blog. Yes. Education, a lot of cultures and respect, respect their cultures, their education. Educate people. So do you mean online courses is helping? Yeah. Online courses to educate people, they can understand about the different countries. Anything else? Do you think that Facebook can help to make conflict or reduce conflict? Social media like Twitter or Facebook? It can do both. It depends how people use it. What, what's more so? <laughs> Which is higher? Anybody? I think mean, the positive. Mm. So you could see I have some Muslim friend on Facebook and they made some posts after the attack in France, right? Other people made some posts. Generally it's very positive posts like this is just some extremist or that kind of thing, right? So can help us to understand a little bit better. But we can do more. Uh, we can, uh, as you say, we can make more of an effort to uh, communicate with people from different cultures and different backgrounds to understand them better. better right? And global media can try to uh, integrate more different cultures and international news. So, next topic is uh, cyber control. Do you like cyber control? What does cyber mean when we say cyber? What are we talking about? IT, the internet. IT, the internet, computers, right? What does control mean? Monitoring, so on, right? So the goal of cyber censorship is the development of a domestic internet, a self-contained world that offers, for example, Chinese versions of many of the online services and entertainments, like Facebook. The non-democratic states at the UN, they want state control of electronic media. Do you have any state control or censorship of the internet in Korea? Warning. 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 Morning site, what kind of site? Uh, to look, um, to sign up the uh, North Korea, North Korea homepage mm -hmm. to keep out the Korea government giving some KDA. Mm -hmm. So you, the Korean government blocks some pages in Korea yeah. related to that? Okay, so the internet freedom is a controversial topic these days. We mentioned already about some guys making cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. So people are talking about freedom of speech. Can you put whatever you want on the internet? If you are an organization like the Ku Klux Klan in the US, which is a racist organization, can you have a homepage on the internet? Should people have access to that or should it be censored? What do you think? Shouldn't be censored. Shouldn't be censored. People should be free to put whatever the kind of things they want on the internet, right? But some things we se people censor in, in uh, the democratic countries they censor too, right? Like illegal activities, that kind of thing is censored, okay? If it's illegal, you're not allowed to do on the internet. But non-democratic states, they don't they don't like criticism of their government. So usually they want to censor the internet because they want to control the people criticizing their government. If you looked at the Middle East, we had some uprising in the Arab Spring a couple of years ago in Egypt and Libya and so on. Okay? A lot of that spread on social media. People were spreading like on Twitter or Facebook where they're meeting, criticizing the president, criticizing the government. Okay? So after that time, some governments got quite concerned. right? And for example, in China, they don't like the criticism of the government much. So they want to be able to censored. So they, they censored, they, Google was negotiating with the Chinese government 
because the Chinese government wanted Google to give them a lot of information and censor a lot of web pages. Google wanted to censor, agree to censor some of them, but not other ones. Facebook the same. The Chinese government wants the access to information, their users' information. They want to uh, Facebook to take away, take off some posts. But Facebook doesn't agree. So these kind of comp companies have some problems in China. So in China they are not used. Facebook is not allowed to be used in China, for example. Uh, so just some foreigners use some kind of <coughs> VPN network to avoid. Uh, they say they're surfing from another country, then you can avoid that kind of thing. So, so many governments feel like that, like the phone net network, the internet should be administered under a multinational treaty. ICANN is the organization which uh, is controlling the internet, and some governments say this is an American control over cyberspace. So the internet was first developed in the US by the military, so they have this organization which is uh, organizing the internet. So uh, the US, Washington oversees the ICANN organization. So there is some political conflict over the nature of media freedom. You may know that a Chinese journalist won the Nobel Prize uh, a couple of years ago, and, but he was a prisoner in China. Do you know his name? Chinese journalist who won the Nobel Prize? Bao <laughs> Zhodong. It wasn't on, it wasn't on the news in China? <laughs> I'm very bad with the Chinese names too, sorry. Liu, do you know Liu Xiaobo? Liu Xiaobo. Liu Xiaobo. Liu Xiaobo. Human rights activist. Okay. Uh, the Chinese government said it didn't like this at all. That he got this price. Okay, so they. He's criticizing them about their human rights record. We already explained about uh, Google in China. Great, great, uh, hmm? great firewall. Yes, great firewall in China. Firewall is censoring the internet. So China's argument is that the internet is being used to make unjust accusations against China. Some there's some false information or accusations against China. And they say China is such a big country, usually they say to Western countries like European countries, you don't understand, you don't have 1.5 billion people living in a small area, right? How can you manage 1.5 billion people in a small area? They say that in China, the preservation of stability, and social stability is important because of the high population in the small areas. So they say, we need to be able to censor. Okay, do you agree with them? think there should be freedom of expression? Yes. Yes. But it's the same here. Hmm? Not like in China, but there are also a lot of things illegal on the internet. Okay. I mean, here in Korea. More than in Europe, yes. Yeah. No, I don't think it's quickly compared to China. No, no, no. Yeah. Just a little bit more. Every country has their own censorship of the uh, internet. So Discuss this question with your partner. Should national governments control the access the citizens have to global Should national governments Thank you. 
Foreigners can use a VPN virtual private network to access Facebook or other internet sites, right? Do you know about that? You guys, do you guys know about VPN? Yes, but we don't need to use it. <laughs> can give you an IP address from another country. So you can. So, like you're saying, it's hard to regulate, right? Any other reason? Do you think people should have free access yes. to all the information? Yes. yes. Why? For example, in the US government. So uh, people were quite annoyed about that. They looked at the emails, all the people's emails. They were collecting all the emails. So the NSA is the National Security Agency in the US, and this is in Britain. They have a combined operation. And they, they uh, look over a lot of the global communications traffic. So you should be aware that if you write an email or make a call on the internet, it's possible that it could be, uh, be being recorded by the NSA <coughs> or somebody like that. Okay. I don't want to make you too paranoid. <laughs> you never send an email again. <laughs> you go on. You'll just use code every time. <laughs> but anyway, they usually take just a few seconds of you know, everything, or they just look for keywords, that kind of thing. So, uh, usually we think of this kind of Skype or so on, emailing, it's better because we can make more cultural exchange or more communities. But it can also mean invasion of privacy. So this is a big debate these days in the UK and the US. How far can the government go to protect people against terrorists? Because they brought in a lot of these programs they said they want to find the terrorists before they uh, do any crimes. So people are saying, is it really effective? Have they caught any terrorists before they did crimes using this system? Then the CIA say, yes, we found this person or this person. And then the people have to think, is it worth it to give up their privacy? So 
Uh, let's discuss this with our partner. How did the revelations in 2013 about electronic data collection by the US National Security Agency, we just talked about, involve the relationship between the nation state and multinational corporations? So, if we think about, we're talking about businesses, so how do these revelations uh, affect or involve the relationship between countries and companies? So I mentioned Yahoo, for example. If we think of Facebook, Facebook also has some meetings with the US government, or Google. So what do you think? So discuss with your partner. US government, Yahoo didn't know that the US government was recording their customers' phone calls and so on. Right? Maybe Facebook didn't know, they didn't know the extent. They knew the US government was doing something, but they didn't know that they were doing as taking as much data, right? Google didn't know. Right? Gmail. Those companies didn't know the, the US government was doing so much surveillance. What do you think is happening with the relationship, or how does it affect the relationship between the US and those kind of companies? No. Hmm? No. Yes? They just can't agree because some corporations don't want to give the government the per personal information of their customers. Mm -hmm. um, for example, now it's Apple and the US government mm -hmm. uh, probably about it. Yes. So they have to negotiate with the government, right? And the government is also doing some things behind their back. They don't like that, right? Companies don't like that the government is hiding from them that they're uh, taking their customers' information or surveying their customers' phone calls or emails. Because later their customer can also blame the company that the government was doing those kind of things. The company then has to make some security system to block the government from getting in, right? That kind of way. So we need to have, uh, we already they had some meetings, Facebook and so on, sat down with Obama and other people from the government to ask them to explain about this revelation of the whistleblower and Yahoo and so on. So they have to discuss together and come up with a reasonable plan and the, the government, the nation state should be more open and transparent and clear with the companies and the people about what they are uh, doing okay? uh, to a reasonable extent. So then do you have any question about uh, today's class? We talked about uh, just generally about globalization, we talked about transport and media. Okay? Global transport and global media. Next class we'll talk about global governance. So, uh, let's finish there for today.
Да,